Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 443rd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Hey, everyone. This is Janice, the Urban Farm Podcast Manager, and I want to say thank you for listening and tell you that with our improved podcasts and newsletters, we are reaching more listeners every day. With all this growth, we've added to our team, and this means we can't operate from our pocket change anymore. We want to thank Lacrosse Boots for becoming a sponsor, helping us make this episode possible, and sustaining our podcast mission. Please consider supporting them when you get your next pair of farm boots. At Lacrosse Boots, we salute the land. The rolling acres you've come to know like the back of your own hands. The fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com to find a dealer near you. Today on our podcast, we have someone who grows delicious produce in the garden, on an allotment, or in the greenhouse. We're talking with Jason Johns about growing tomatoes. Jason is the author of Growing Tomatoes, Your Guide to Growing Delicious Tomatoes at Home, as well as 17 other self-published gardening books on everything from greenhouse gardening to growing giant pumpkins. Jason is passionate about gardening, having grown his own produce for over 20 years. He started with a second-hand greenhouse, an 8 by 6 patch of his mother's garden, and far too many tomato plants. After turning the greenhouse into a tomato farm, he was hooked at the taste of the first ripe tomato. Welcome to the show today, Jason. Are you ready to rock tomatoes? I certainly am, Greg. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? When I was young, my my parents grew plants at home. They grew vegetables. We had an old World War II air raid shelter in the garden, and they grew mushrooms in it at the time. Wow. And being a normal child, it was just something we did. I wasn't overly interested. But then as I sort of grew up and got into my early 20s, I sort of thought, Actually, this is quite good fun. I quite enjoy it. It's relaxing. I had a very stressful job in IT. Um, I was uh, you know, working long hours. So it was really nice to get outside and really connect with nature. And over time, it became something I did more and more and more. I, I moved into one house, ripped up all the lawn and turned it into a, a vegetable garden. Probably about seven or eight years ago, I, I got what we have, what we call an allotment over here, which is basically... It's a community-run vegetable patch. They give you three to sort of 800 square feet of ground, and you just plant what you want and, and have fun. It's, it's very, very nice, and it's good in sort of urban areas where a lot of people don't have large gardens. So we, I've got my first allotment, and I really enjoyed it. Then I got a second one on the same plot, and then we moved and uh, sort of got another allotment and it's just built up and I, I've just realized it's something I'm very very passionate about and it turned into a career for me a few a few years ago because my son was was taken very seriously ill and we weren't able to work and I needed some sort of income so I turned to writing because it was something I was good at and couldn't decide what to write on so I thought I'll write about gardening and it turns out I was reasonably good at it and people enjoyed the books, and it's just gone from strength to strength. My son's made a full recovery, and now I write gardening books. I spend a lot of time at the allotment, and I grow all sorts of weird and wonderful veg. And what what I don't use uh, gets donated to friends, family, or even the local soup kitchen, who are very appreciative of any fresh vegetables coming their way. Oh, I'm sure. So, wow, there's a whole lot for me to ask you in, in that what you just shared. So I can't tell you how many IT professionals that I've had on the show <laughs> that have converted because of mm-hmm. they wanted to go from the high stress to the, you know, the lower stress job. So how's that been for you? It's been absolutely fantastic. I, I used to do a lot of traveling. So I, I would regularly get up at sort of five o'clock in the morning, drive for two and a half hours to a customer site, work all day, and then drive home. Or I'd be away in the week 
I mean, for, for six months of my life, I commuted from England to Switzerland. So I drove to an airport, got on a plane, landed, got on the train and the bus, went to work, stayed there until Friday, and then came all the way back again. Wow. So, unfortunately, it was uh, long hours, a lot of work. And whilst the, the financial rewards were good, sort of, I, I suppose, the emotional, mental and spiritual rewards, I felt were lacking somewhat. And having the opportunity to work for myself uh, do, doing this is, I just feel so much more free and relaxed and a lot less stressed. And this is the purpose of this podcast. One of the big purposes of this podcast is to encourage people to look there in their life. Because if you're in a job that you hate, that doesn't serve you, figure out another way. So Absolutely. I mean, it's taken me oh, 20, 20 years to find my passion and decide what I wanted to do in my life. I, I'm finally here. I finally worked out what I want to do. And I love every minute of it. Love it. Yay. So you said your passion, and I can hear the passion in your voice. You're passionate enough to have written 18 books on gardening. I have, um, yes. Wow. So tell me about some of them. Well, I started off, uh, I, th I think one of my first books was about growing giant pumpkins, because that year I decided I was going to try something new. I do this every year. I grow something I've never grown before. Nice. And I thought I'd grow giant pumpkins. And I, I put one in the ground. I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. So I, I bought uh, Atlantic giant seeds, planted them. They started to grow and they, they just took over the, you know, the entire allotment. As you probably know, pumpkin plants are huge. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it was a real big learning experience. But at the end of it, I had a, a pumpkin that weighed I think it was close to about 120 pounds. Whoa. That's a small pumpkin right. uh, from this, this breed. Th these will grow to sort of five or 600 pounds quite often. But I, I hadn't given it the right attention because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I, I was absolutely hooked and I learned all about it. And uh, I mean, the, we lived in a little village in the countryside and the local shop asked me if they could have it to auction off at Halloween oh, to, nice. to raise money for charity. So. Everyone thought it was amazing that we'd, I'd grown it. And I, I just thought it was really exciting. So that uh, was a subject I wrote about that I loved. But I then wrote about other things that I enjoyed. I wrote about growing garlic and potatoes and, and chilies as well. I, I started growing chilies the other year, two or three years ago. And it was just wonderful growing these super hot chilies and then feeding them to my brother-in-law and my brother I'm watching their faces turn red. <laughs> there you go. So that, that was wonderful. And uh, I, I bought myself a greenhouse. And again, I learned all about that, started growing things and thought, this is really, really good. Mm -hmm. Everyone should know about this. So again, yeah. I wrote a book about that. And one of my favorite subjects is I, I then started thinking, well, how can I reduce my need for pesticides and keep the you know, pests and diseases away from my plants? So I started practicing what we call companion planting. So you plant two plants together and they benefit each other. And again, that was turned out to be quite successful. So it was like, and a quick example is when you plant carrots, if you plant onions near them, mm -hmm. it confuses carrot fly. Carrot fly hunts by smell. And because the onions are near the carrots, the carrot fly can't smell the carrots. So it's simple things like this right. that just really make a difference. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I love what, one of the things that you said. You said you try something new every year. Yes. That's really important. That's how I learned how to grow asparagus or fennel because that's something I've done in the past. What, what kind of weird things have you tried? That's your word, by uh, the way. <laughs> well, the, I, I tried growing something called cucamelons, and they're – they're these weird little, they're about the size of a grape, mm -hmm. but they have the consistency of a melon with a cucumber taste. Mm. And they're, they're very peculiar. They were really, really difficult to germinate. Uh, but eventually I got some going and I, I grew them. And um, unfortunately, I, I must admit, I didn't really like them. But uh, my niece did, so she got loads and loads of them. But again, some years I grow stuff that I like and some years I don't. Last year I grew gherkins, uh, pickling cucumbers yep. for the first first year. Mm -hmm. I've got about 40 jars 
of of pickles in my cupboards now. Uh, they they went so. We had a very very hot summer in England last year, mm-hmm. and they loved it. Oh, I bet. So I I must have had about two hundred pickling cucumbers. Wow. Um, so everyone I know has had these gherkins last year. That's what I love about nature. It is so incredibly abundant. In fact, I tell people all the time that there's only one place on the planet that this notion of lack lives, and that's between our ears. Because when I look at nature and the fruits on you know the of my labors, literally, it's amazing. It It, it is. I mean, I, I grew uh, runner beans, green beans last year, and there was so many of them. <laughs> I, I, I've filled a drawer in my freezer so i had enough for about six months i've given them to everyone i knew and i still had loads they just keep yeah. on producing so i took um, i took probably oh must have been about 30 or 40 pounds of these down to the soup kitchen to uh, because i just couldn't use them all yeah it's wonderfully abundant. Yeah. So I don't want to lose track. I, you and I could talk for a long time, but I don't want to lose track of your book. We got you here to talk about growing tomatoes, your guide to growing delicious tomatoes at home. Tell me about the book, how it came about, and then I've got some fun questions for you. Okay. Well, I like tomatoes. I've They were the first thing I ever really grew, and I, I kind of love the different types of tomatoes. The first time I went to America, I discovered yellow tomatoes because you, you have them in your supermarkets there. Yep. And at the time, we, we never had them over here. It was only in the last two or three years that we've started getting the different color tomatoes. And I, I had my first yellow tomato in, in America and thought it was amazing. Mm-hmm. So, of course, I had to come back and find out if I could grow them myself. And since then, I've grown yellow, orange, striped, black, uh, green. And I love the, the color in them all. When you make a salad mm-hmm. and you put the colored tomatoes in, it really brightens it up. And if you serve it to people, they always want to know more about the tomatoes. And I, I think tomatoes are, t- to be honest, probably the, the most popular thing to grow at home. Everyone tries to grow tomatoes. Yep. We call them the, the gateway drug of getting people into gardening. They certainly are, yes. So in your book, you talk about a lot of great things, and one of them is how to grow a great tomato. And in our pre-conversation, you mentioned soil. Uh, and so let's start there. What kind of soil do we need to create for best success of t- growing tomatoes? They like a good soil that drains well. They don't like sitting in water, but they also they like a, quite a, a loose soil that's that's got that's well aerated so they can get lots of oxygen to the roots. Mm -hmm. So you can plant them in your garden and they will grow. Then perhaps not so keen on heavy clay, but they will grow in most other soils. But if you're growing them in containers, then what I would recommend is an equal mix of a good quality compost. Don't don't buy cheap compost because it dries out too quickly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't drain very well. And usually it's got big lumps of material right. in that hasn't broken down. So that doesn't do your plants any good. So you, know, you buy decent quality compost and then mix it equally with peat moss, which again aerates the soil and just gives it a bit of, makes it a bit looser. And then you add some perlite, which again helps it drain. And that's by far the best mix you can make for, for tomatoes in containers. Perfect. So we start with a good base of soil underneath. Mm-hmm. Now we have to decide which tomatoes to grow because I know there's, you know, there's vining tomatoes and there's bush tomatoes and there's, you mentioned it, many different colors. So your first chapter in your book is which tomatoes do I grow? Help me with that. Right. Well, my answer to everyone is what do you like to eat? Oh, amen to that. So there's no point growing cherry tomatoes if you like making pasta sauces you want to grow a plum tomato so i always say think about what you're going to use them for and then grow the tomatoes that you you will use Mm. but you've also got to think about the space if you haven't got a lot of space you want the bush tomatoes if you've got more space then you can go for the indeterminate or the vining tomatoes but they require a lot more maintenance you've got pit pinch the growing tips off you've got to pull the side shoots off and and that does require a lot a bit more work mm-hmm. and not all of us have the time to maintain the plants like that in which case sort of the the bush or determinant tomatoes are the better option however there's fewer of the bush varieties available there's a much more variety in the vining tomatoes 
So, but again, it depends on how you you are going to grow, use them. But you've also got to think about your growing season. If you live in a cooler area, you, you might want to buy varieties that have shorter, that mature faster. Um, so they'll mature anything from sort of 70 to about 100 days, depending on the variety. Uh-huh. So in cool, cooler areas, you go for the shorter season tomatoes because then you're not going to get caught out by the frost and you've got more chance of them all ripening and you, know, you don't lose your crop then. Perfect. And so what conditions are best for tomatoes? Because I know in Arizona, you know, it'll get to 110 plus degrees. That's uh, what, about 40 C? If I my brain is working correct, which is pretty dang hot. That's a little bit warm, yes. Tomatoes need a lot of warmth. They want about eight hours of sun a day, if not a bit more. Mm-hmm. They need three to four months of consistently warm weather. Uh, what, what I've noticed in England, as you probably know, our weather isn't brilliant. And on the years when we have poor summers, the tomatoes just don't ripen. They need that warmth. When it comes to producing fruit, a tomato needs a nighttime temperature of between uh, about 55 to 75 Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. But what, when the night temperature rises, when it goes above 85 Fahrenheit, the fruit won't colour properly, so it will stay green. It will still ripen, it just won't redden. And then when the temperature gets too high and it goes above about 95 Fahrenheit, the tomato plants actually stop growing at that point. Uh, but the, the, the key is is to give them lots and lots of water. They, they do like a good drink, but you, like a lot of plants, you've got to be careful not to overwater them. If they have too much water, then you end up with blossom end rot yep. on your tomatoes. That's where the, the base of the tomato starts going brown and falling inwards and you ruin your crop. And then when it comes to ripening your tomatoes, they don't want sunlight, they want warmth. They need to be warm. So what I quite often do if I'm growing tomatoes outside and it's it's getting to sort of September time is I'll put canes around the tomatoes and then wrap plastic wrap around them to make like a mini greenhouse. Oh, right. Um, so they get the heat to, to ripen. Cool. When we're planting the tomatoes, I usually plant them a little deeper and take off the side shoots, but there's also the side shoots on the plants that we want to be aware of. What? Tell me about that. Okay, well, planting them deeper is a really, really good idea. Tomatoes are one of the few vegetables that will actually grow roots from the stem of the plant. Quite often when you're growing them, you'll see they lean over and then you see these white things appearing near the soil. Mm -hmm. Those are extra roots. So if you live in a, a, and growing them outside and you live in a windy area, you plant them a little bit deeper than you would normally and just remove the bottom two or three leaves and then they'll they'll be a lot more secure in the soil, less chance of them blowing over. But with the vining tomatoes or indeterminate tomatoes, as they're often labelled on the seed packets, as they grow, they produce sort of suckers or side shoots between the main stem and the leaves and these will grow into stems and start producing fruit and flowers and before you know it your one tomato plant is 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 turned into some sort of monster yeah and i mean that's okay if you live in a, a warm area where there's no chance of frost because they'll just keep growing and growing but for those of us that live in more temperate environments it means that the plant is putting all its energy into producing all the all the leaves and the stems and it's not producing the fruit so what we do is you p- carefully pinch those side shoots off and then when the tomato plant reaches a certain height it, it again depends on where you are in a greenhouse you let it get to about five or six sets of flowers high and if you're growing outside you might only let it get three or four depending on how warm your environment is, then you pinch the top off Mm -hmm. and it concentrates its energy then on producing the flowers and the fruit, which is obviously what you want to do. And you've got to keep a close eye on these tomatoes because they will produce those suckers all day long. And you'll you'll do it one day, you'll pull them all off and you come back the next day and there'll be more. More of them, yeah. But if you catch them early in the season, what you can do, let them grow a little bit longer, let them grow to about sort of eight to ten inches long, pinch them off and put them in water. They'll then produce roots. Oh, wow. You can plant them then into soil and you've got more free tomato plants. 
How cool is that? I have never heard that. I've been growing food and tomatoes for over 40 years, and I've never heard that. That's great. Oh, it's a great way. If you ever go to a store and you buy a tomato plant and it's a, a good tomato plant and you think, oh, I want a few more, you let it produce the side shoots, you pinch them off, and you root them, and it's, uh, it's a good way to get extra plants. That's a nice hack. I love that. <laughs> so what kind of pests might I encounter with tomatoes? Well, much as we love tomatoes, unfortunately, uh, pests like them as well. And again, it depends on where you live as to what pests you're going to encounter. One of the common ones, particularly in uh, America, is tomato hornworm. Yep. They're, they're quite destructive, um, but they're quite big. They grow, I think, to about three inches long. So you can pick them off by hand, but they, they, they are the same color. They are green. So if you get, want to find out if you've got them, you can spray your plant with water and then they'll start wiggling and then you can pick them off uh, and destroy them. Yes. And another common problem, again, particularly in the USA, is tomato cutworm. And they come up from the ground. So you put a, a, a collar, you can make one out of cardboard or plastic, or you can buy them if you want, around the base of the plant and slightly up the stem, and it stops these cutworms getting onto your tomato plants. Before you go past that, I want to talk about the tomato cutworm and really cutworms in general and how they work. You can have this beautiful little three-inch tall plant, and you come out the next day, and literally it's timber. It's been chopped off at the base. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. They're very, very destructive, unfortunately, and they, they will decimate your crop. Yeah. They really will. So, as I said, if, you, if they are in your area, you can put these collars around your, the base of your plant. And it will stop them. Yeah, perfect. And then you were going to say another. Oh, yes. Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's a few more. N nematodes, there's a, a nematode that attacks the roots of your tomato plants. And when you pull them up, if you see like lumps on the roots, then mm -hmm. that's, that's the nematodes. Usually, if you rotate your crops so you don't grow tomatoes in the same place every year in, in the soil, then generally you will avoid them. But they can still be a problem in some areas. They're very, very difficult to treat, unfortunately. The other uh, Probably one of the most common ones is flea beetles. Again, they're very, very destructive. And you can get these little yellow sticky t traps. They're like fly paper mm -hmm. that you can hang up, hang up near your tomato plants and it will sort of catch them and uh, keep them away. But the main thing with the tomato plants is don't let the base of them get covered in debris. So if leaves fall off or, or leaves blow in from elsewhere, just, just remove them. If you keep the soil clear, then that keeps a lot of pests and diseases away. Beautiful. And one, one of the things that I've noticed after growing for as many decades as I have, and that is the healthier the plants, the less susceptible they're going to be to pests. Have you found that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I thoroughly agree. If you keep your plants healthy, you feed them and water them well, then they, they will, just, just, just like a human, if we're healthy, we resist disease. Whereas if you get run down, as you probably well know, you'll get every bug in the neighborhood. Right. So there's also this tomato blight that I just want to touch briefly on. Tell me about it and how do we stop it? Right. It's, it's the bane of everybody's life that grows to tomatoes. Unfortunately, it, very little you can do to stop it. it. It's a fungal disease and the spores blow in on the wind. If you're growing in the greenhouse, you're less likely to find it, but it will still come in because you, you can bring the spores in on your shoes or your, your trousers or, or anything else. So um, it tends to appear quite early on in the summer or early to mid-summer, and it's more common in damp and warm weather. Like any fungus, mm. it likes to be da damp and warm. Uh -huh. Once it's established itself, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. There, there isn't really anything that's effective against it. Um, you, you'll spot it because you, you'll get these brown spots starting to appear on the leaves and the stems, and then they all will start to die back. And t to be honest, it's very, very quick in, in how quickly it will kill your tomato plants off. If you do have this in your area, then you can obviously start growing your tomato plants early. Start, start them off indoors and plant them out so they're starting to mature before then or buy disease-resistant varieties. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of breeding going on. You can buy varieties that have good disease resistance, particularly to blight, but you do have to remember that doesn't mean they're immune. 
it just means they'll resist it for longer. Usually they will su- succumb, but not before they've produced the fruit. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just uh, pulled up tomato blight on Google, and I've actually had this before. The good news for us here in Phoenix is it's dry all the w- in our tomato growing season. Yeah, uh, and so we don't get we don't have to deal with this very often because it is quite dry for most of the year. Here. Unfortunately, here in England, as everyone in the world knows, we get an awful lot of rain. Yeah, and uh, we have very damp summers. And unfortunately, t- the, the tomato blight will spread to your potatoes. It can affect uh, eggplant and uh, peppers and other members of the same family as well. So, wow, I love this book. It's a beautiful book. I'm looking at it online at it right now. Growing Tomatoes, Your Guide to Growing Delicious Tomatoes at Home. Thank you for sharing about that. My pleasure. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Well, my my first experience with growing tomatoes, you touched on it in the bio. It was... I, I was young and naive, as they sometimes say, but I, I bought one of these tomato growing kits. They're little plastic greenhouse, and you get some soil and some seeds, and I thought, I'll have a go. And I, I scattered the seeds, and I did think there was quite a few. Turns out I grew about 50 tomato plants. Wow. I get that I, I didn't think they would all germinate, but they all, almost all of them germinated. I, I had so many of them. I gave them away to everyone I knew, and I still had loads. Mm-hmm. I couldn't bring myself to throw them away because um, I'd grown these plants and they were my babies. So I thought, right, I'm going to plant them. So we had this greenhouse. I got it all prepared, and I planted the tomatoes in there. And they started to grow. I watered them religiously and looked after them. And it was my first real experience. I didn't know a lot about growing tomatoes. And before I knew it, these tomatoes were coming out of the greenhouse windows and pushing the glass. <laughs> and, and nice. And you could, couldn't get in the greenhouse anymore. Uh-huh. Uh, and obviously, I, I just really didn't know what to do. So I, I very quickly, I, back in those days, I went to the library and got a book mm-hmm. and started to, to, to read, realized what I'd done done wrong and went home and fought my way into the greenhouse and started cutting them back and removing the side shoots and that year I, I'm out of all those plants I probably got about half a dozen tomatoes um. and whilst that's a big fa- it, it was a big failure to me it was a big success because I had those half a dozen tomatoes which were just so wonderful yeah. and it, as I said I tell people now about that and they just think it's hilarious well, yeah, as I said, it's a shame I haven't got any pictures of the greenhouse because it was like something out of a cartoon with these plants coming out of every available hole, and it was a, it was interesting. <laughs> I'll bet I can, I can imagine that absolutely. So, what do you consider your biggest success? Well, well, we, I took on an allotment several years ago now, and when they, when I looked at it, it was no word of a lie, shoulder deep in weeds oh wow it was it was horrible as i i sort of walked across it in the weeds and you'd, you'd trip over things and I, f- I found there was raised beds in there eventually and again you know it was uh it was a, a big big job and i i just took it a little bit of time i went down every day just did an hour or two didn't stress myself do too much and then I, I I cleared it all. I built up more raised beds. I put down nice wood chip paths, and it turned into a really really productive vegetable bed. And it was probably must have been about six or seven hundred square feet of of ground. So it was wasn't a small area. And to have taken it from this, as I said, this just mass of weeds. It had uh, nettles and comfrey, and comfrey is really really difficult to get rid of. Yep. It had lemon balm. Again, very invasive, and I, I, I turned it into a, a lovely, productive vegetable bed, and I really enjoyed the process. You know, it's always amazing to me how quickly nature steps in and takes over. It, it is. You've, you've just got to look at an old building. I mean, old buildings have trees starting to grow out of the mm-hmm. the brickwork. So, yeah, na- nature's grow anywhere. Yeah. So what drives you? Well, what drives me is I just love being outside. I think I spent a long time in an office and obviously in my car driving between offices. And when I'm outside, I don't know, it appeals to some almost primeval part of me that I'm connecting with nature. I'm doing Mm. something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm I'm not sat in front of a computer or a, a mobile phone, a, a, a tablet or something like that. And you can just be at one with nature. You listen to the sounds of the traffic and the birds and everything else. And it just makes you feel good. And the scientists have actually found that there's microbes in the soil that help combat depression. Yep. And I, I really do think that it, I mean, I call my allotment, my vegetable garden, my therapist. <laughs> of you know, course. You, you go there and as you, you can practice mindfulness. You just live in the moment and you're working with your vegetables and the soil. And as you do, you you kind of, your brain ticks over on your problems and all your problems start to get solved. You work things out. And it, it's... It's wonderful to be able to bring all these vegetables home and the fruit. And I said, I, I supply it to my friends and family and I take excess projects, uh, produce to soup kitchens as well now. And it's lovely to be able to produce this healthy food and to enjoy it myself and to allow other people to enjoy it. I just love when I give people things that I've grown and they enjoy it. Especially the soup kitchen, I'll bet. They absolutely loved it. But last year... I, I had my first success with carrots and I gave carrots to my in-laws when, when I made a meal and they were stunned and couldn't believe that they were actually carrots because they really did taste like carrots. Carrots, yeah. Yeah, they had a real proper carrot taste and you just don't get that in supermarket produce, unfortunately, anymore. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? The book I'd probably recommend that I think had one of the biggest impacts on my life was not a gardening book it was actually called unlimited power by anthony robbins who i'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with oh yes um i mean i've i've, I've read an awful lot of books in my time i've got i've probably got about four or five thousand books in the house i love books and this one really really made me think and it was it was this book that basically set me on the path because i realized that i didn't have to follow this nine to five stressing in an office and that I could make a living following my passion. He was doing something he loved. I, I saw him live several times when he came to do seminars mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, he's doing something he's really passionate about and he loves doing it. And I was, it, it just started percolating through my brain and thinking, can I do something like this? What could I do like this? And I must admit, I tried a few things and none of them were really for me. And then, like I said, I came through to this gardening and just thought, I absolutely love this. And I realized that's what I was passionate about. And I mean, I, I used to run a gardening club with school children. Um, I, I, I write about it. I'm active on social media. I love sharing this information and helping other people grow their own at home. It's just a wonderful experience. Well, I'm a big, big believer that the most important thing we can be doing right now is learning where our food comes from and learning how to grow it. Absolutely. I really do agree with you on that. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? What I would say to them is just give it a go. Failure isn't a bad thing. It, it, it's feedback telling you how to do something better. I've been trying to grow carrots for about five or six years. I have never, ever managed to produce a decent carrot. Last year, I finally cracked it and I produced loads and loads of wonderful, long, straight, delicious carrots. Mm -hmm. And the secret was I grew them in, in about three foot high raised beds filled with a very, very sandy soil mix. And they worked. They loved it. And, you know, I've been trying for years. I'm trying different things. And this is the thing with gardening is people think it's a short term game, but it's not. It's a long term game. When you're working with nature, you're not get, going to get results in the next week or the next month. You have to wait some, sometimes years. You know, you plant a, a baby apple tree and it could be three or four years before it produces you fruit. And to me, it's this whole gardening thing is meant to be fun. And that's what I'd like your listeners to remember. Just just enjoy yourself. If you don't like something, don't grow it. You know, we're, we're meant to grow. Yeah, as allotment owners, there's things that you're almost expected to grow, like runner beans, which I, I don't like. So I grow French climbing beans. You're meant to plant garlic as well, because everyone plants garlic over winter. But again, I don't particularly like garlic, but I grow it anyway. Mm -hmm. I give it away. I give it away. Right. You know, so I've, you know, there's something I'm growing over winter, so I'm not bored and I'm not doing nothing. And then come sort of June, July time, I can harvest it all and 
my my sister loves it. She smokes it, and she's got a smoker, so she creates smoked garlic. So I give it to her, and I take the excess to the um, soup kitchen and, and give it away to friends and family. And it's all about just experimenting, trying new things, and just finding what it is that you love doing. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing with us today, Jason. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, they can find me on Instagram or Twitter. I'm at allotment owner, or they can visit my website, which is gardeningwithjason.com. They can contact me through any of those, and the details uh, for these are in the back of my books. And I always welcome people to get in contact and talk to me. I, uh, again, I'm on YouTube. I produce YouTube videos about gardening. And again, I answer comments on there and talk to people. And I just love sort of helping and, and sharing my knowledge as best as I can. I can tell. And we also have a surprise for our listeners today. We want to thank Jason Johns and Book Pub Co. Publishing as they have given us some copies of Growing Tomatoes, your guide to growing delicious tomatoes at home that we're going to be sharing with you all. If you'd like to enter our drawing, please email us at podcast at urbanfarm.org with the subject line, I love growing delicious tomatoes. Make sure you provide us your name and mailing address. We will pick random emails from the first 50 people who respond during the giveaway. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash growing tomatoes. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. At La Crosse Boots, we salute the land, the rolling acres you've come to know like the back of your own hands, the fertile soil where your family has grown and your everyday moments have blossomed into everlasting memories. For this land is your land, your bedrock, your private parcel of earth that keeps you firmly grounded to what truly matters most. For it is the land of bonfires that torch a night sky. The land of dirt-flinging afternoons that wash away everything but the here and the now. The land where you plant seeds of strength and promise, of faith and togetherness. And so, with rubber on foot and pride in soul, you work the land, you play the land, proudly honoring the timeless agreement that by always nurturing the land, it will forever return the favor. Lacrosse Boots, done right since 1897. Visit us at lacrossefootwear.com to find a dealer near you.